all starts here. This is a podcast focusing on the communication and education of topics in reproductive science and women's health. I'm your host, Olivia Moyer, and we are back here today at the Institute for Women's Health here in London at UCL. And today we are going to be talking about a pregnancy condition that is called ectopic pregnancies. And just to get this out there in the beginning of the episode, um, ectopic pregnancies, as we will cover today, often do end in pregnancy loss. So this is a podcast episode dealing with a subject that might be sensitive to our listeners. So of course, if this is something that you are not comfortable listening to today, please don't continue, but it will have some good bits of information. Um, And also just remember that there are important resources that if you are dealing with pregnancy loss that you can reach out to um, and different clinics in your area. So with that being said, um, I have with me Dr. Annie Salangan, who is a obstetrician and gynecologist specializing in early pregnancy, gynecology and advanced ultrasound at UCLH. Presently, she is undertaking a PhD in ectopic pregnancy and pregnancies of unknown location under the supervision of Professor Yurkovic here at UCL. Um, It is such a pleasure to have you here with me today and why don't we just really just jump right into things and um, firstly let's talk a little bit of background on maybe what ectopic pregnancies are if you were going to sort of broadly explain this field to a listener. Yeah sure, Um, first of all thanks for having me on this podcast. Um, So yeah, an ectopic pregnancy, for those um, who don't know, is a pregnancy that's not implanted in the cavity of the uterus or the womb. So that's sort of the inner part of the womb. And we'll just go a little bit back to basics in terms of the womb structure. So you've got the outer layer, you've got the middle layer, which is the main muscle, and then you've got the sort of lining inside, which is where a pregnancy would normally implant. So that's what I mean by cavity. And an ectopic pregnancy is any pregnancy that essentially isn't implanted within that cavity. So you can get generally two sort of broad classifications. You've got um, uterine ectopic pregnancies and you've got extra uterine ectopic pregnancies. The most common is extra uterine, so that's um, in the fallopian tube. And that's the tube that carries the pregnancy from the ovary and transports it into the cavity of the womb. So if you were to get an ectopic pregnancy, you would most likely get it in the fallopian tube. Okay. You can also get ones like on the ovary, um, you can get some implanted in the abdomen, um, you can get something called a rudimentary horn pregnancy, so there's lots of different types. And then the uterine ectopic pregnancies are um, ones that are found kind of within the, the muscle of the womb. So you can get one called intramural, which is essentially within the muscle of the womb. And actually you can get one on the cesarean section scar. So if women have had a cesarean section before, you can get pregnancy implanting into the scar. You can also get one called survival ectopic pregnancy. So that's, well, yeah, you, you can get them in lots of different places. Uh, most commonly they are found in the fallopian tube. Okay. Yeah, and the significance of an ectopic pregnancy. I mean, it happens in about 1% of um, pregnancies. Um, if it's not found early enough um, and it's allowed to, you know, continue to, um, to grow, in some cases it can lead to the woman being quite unwell, um, pain, bleeding, etc., things like that, which is why we're, um, we want to pick it up early and we want to make sure that the woman is well. Okay. Interesting. Wow. It's and you said abdomen. How mm. does that? How does that work? come about? First, yeah. just to make a first pit stop there. Yeah. Um, so it just means yeah, outside of the uterus, and you've got this cavity called your abdomen and your pelvis, um, which is usually where things like your gut um, stay. You know, mm. that's where your gut is. So you can get the most common reason why you might get an abdominal ectopic pregnancy is actually if you get a pregnancy that was in the tube yeah. that has fallen out of the tube oh, wow. and then it kind of implants and then starts growing from there. It's Isn't really it? rare, yeah. really, really rare. Um, and yesterday actually I just gave a teaching presentation about this um, and yeah, it's, it's an interesting phenomenon. Mm-hmm. Um, 
I think we are seeing it slightly more with cesarean section pregnancies that grow outside and then they, they then get their blood supply from outside of the womb. Um, but yeah, on the whole, it is, it's a rare ectopic pregnancy. Interesting. Okay. So um, in terms of why this happens, ectopic mm -hmm. pregnancies, um, I know you mentioned that previous pregnancies, whether it was cesarean section mm -hmm. delivery or potentially scars, um, are there other kind of risk factors that are involved or I, I, you know, how does this come about really? Yeah, so um, from the studies that um, have been done, so about two thirds of women with an ectopic pregnancy may have a risk factor. Mm -hmm. And the most common ones are things like having had a previous ectopic pregnancy naturally increases your risks of the, having another one in the future. Um, also things like problems with the fallopian tube, so if you've had a previous infection before, that means that you know, the pregnancy can't travel down the tube. Um, if you've had things like previous surgery, um, and what that does is it can cause scar tissue inside the pelvis, which just means that some things might get stuck to each other. Um, that can hinder things like the fallopian tube transporting the egg um, into the womb. Things like um, assisted reproductive therapy, so I, most people commonly know about this um, in terms of IVF pregnancies, mm -hmm. that can also increase the risk. Mm -hmm. um, smoking increases the risk. Mm -hmm. um, maternal age over the age of 35 also increases the risk. And another thing um, that might increase it are certain types of contraception. Mm. Um, I want to um, stress on the whole that contraception, by the way, it works, re you know, reduces your chances of conceiving. Um, so that means on the whole, your chances of having an anectopic pregnancy are also reduced. Mm -hmm. But in some cases um, where it hasn't worked, and we know not all contraception is 100% effective, um, it may be that the woman is at risk of having an ectopic pregnancy. So for example, when, when women get their tubes clipped, um, tubal ligation, if that doesn't work um, in terms of preventing pregnancy, sometimes it can um, get stuck in the fallopian tube and develop into an ectopic pregnancy. Okay. Yeah. Wow. But the important thing as well, actually, is that I've said two thirds have risk factors. About a third of women will not have any risk factors, and it will just be, unfortunately, one of those things that comes out of the blue. Wow. Okay. Okay. So then, let's say you know a woman presents with you know type of pregnancy, um, which also to cover that sort of like, I guess this would be diagnosed pretty early on, hopefully in pregnancy. Hopefully, yes. So as long as, um, you know, as long as, uh, generally women with ectopic pregnancies will have symptoms. So mm -hmm. we always advise women, you know, if you're having pain mm -hmm. or bleeding in early pregnancy, mm -hmm. go to your local early pregnancy unit and just get checked out just to make sure um, that everything's okay. And nowadays with advances and things like our ultrasounds, our imaging, we're actually able to detect ectopic pregnancies at a much earlier stage. I think historically it always used to be one of those things that were diagnosed at surgery um, quite late on um, and we've definitely moved away from you know diagnostic surgery for ectopic pregnancies now for, for most cases so um, with the advances of ultrasound so that also means that less women are becoming severely unwell mm -hmm. because we can pick it up early um, we can monitor them we could offer treatment as well. Um, so, yeah. Interesting. Okay, so then in terms of the management, so mm -hmm. sort of brushed over this, but your PhD, you mm -hmm. are focusing in different parts of ectopic pregnancy, mm -hmm. but also looking at the management mm -hmm. of ectopic pregnancies and the different ways that this can be done. So um, maybe you can talk a little bit about this. Yeah, so yeah, um, lots of different projects in my PhD, but um, one of them is looking at and comparing the different treatment options for ectopic pregnancy. Um, and I'll just tell you about the three broad treatment groups for um, ectopic pregnancy. And I'll, I'll just focus on tubal ectopic pregnancy at the moment. Okay. I, think, I think for most ectopic pregnancies, these treatments um, are 
are, you know, this is how you would treat those other ectopic pregnancies, but there's a few sort of certain cases where these may not be applicable. Mm -hmm. So let's just say because 99% of ectopic pregnancies are in the fallopian tube, mm -hmm. let's just talk about treatment of that. Okay. So one is surgery, um, where you remove the ectopic pregnancy, and that's usually done through keyhole surgery nowadays. Um, back in the past, it used to be a, a smaller cut in your tummy, but now um, they're very small cuts um, in sort of your belly button and one maybe either side of your lower tummy. Um, and we do that to remove the ectopic pregnancy, and it's a reasonably straightforward procedure, um, and hopefully if everything's well, then the woman can go home the next day. Okay. And for most ectopic pregnancies, um, that's the way to treat it. Um, and there are certain criteria as to when you would think that's more appropriate, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to the other two options. So, for example, you know, if there's a large ectopic pregnancy, or the pregnancy hormone levels are quite high, or you know, the woman has lots of pain, or if there's blood inside the pelvis as well, then mm -hmm. you de definitely would want to do surgery. Mm -hmm. Some women may say, I don't actually want to do the other two options, I'd rather go for surgery as well, and that's that's a reasonable option. Um, and then the other two is, uh, so let's talk about medical management, mm -hmm. which in most places in the UK, um, in the world, they use something called methotrexate. Okay. And this is an injection um, that's given, usually as an initial dose, and you may need other doses afterwards. And what it does is it essentially stops um, fast dividing cells, okay. um, so that's the rationale for using it on a, on an ectopic pregnancy. Um, there are side effects to methotrexate, um, so things like an upset tummy, um, sometimes in rare cases it can affect things like your white blood cells or your lungs etc, things like that, so you need to be reasonably fit to have it, um, it won't be appropriate in some cases, for example very high pregnancy hormone levels. Um, and also afterwards you'd want to say try not to get pregnant for three months once treatment's finished because it can impact a new pregnancy in the future. Um, and in terms of effectiveness, it range, the studies range between 60 to 90 percent. It just depends on what the study is, you know, what the study is, what it's looking at, etc. Things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that's part of the interesting thing that my research highlights is you know um, it's more a why is there such a disparity in terms of effectiveness of methotrexate and it really depends when you look deep down at the studies it depends on things like patient selection like what are the groups that they've yeah. chosen what do they define as treatment success yeah. what um, methotrexate regimen have they used um, you know what's the diagnostic criteria for an ectopic pregnancy so there's lots of different things that come out yeah. and then you realize actually it's really hard to compare mm -hmm. um, and to definitely say that this one's more effective or not um, but I'll talk a little bit more about that I think at a later stage um, before I forget the last treatment <laughs> option which is expectant management so it's essentially um, uh, waiting watchful waiting and monitoring um, so what you do is you do a regular blood tests to make sure that the pregnancy hormone levels are falling. Right. Um, you advise the woman when to come back, um, you know, a, a, give a strong safety net of we're here. If you're worried, please go to your local hospital or you can come to us during um, daylight hours, symptoms to look out for, etc. And, and so the woman... Um, needs to be compliant with that and by that I mean sometimes people will say I, don't, I, you know, I just don't want to keep coming back into hospital I've got a job I've got children etc mm -hmm. things like that so it may not be appropriate for everyone and also it's um, it's not appropriate for very high pregnancy hormone levels or if there's lots of blood in the pelvis right you know things like that so um, similar to methotrexate and expectant management, um, they're generally reserved for more clinically stable right. um, women. Um, and yeah, so the expectant management, I think, has been around for a while in the UK, um, but still a lot of people depend on things like methotrexate. Yeah. So if you look at, for example, in the US, um, I'm sure there's people 
in the US you use expectant management, but what struck me before was looking at social media when a US doctor was like, oh, you know, how about this expectant management? Maybe we don't need to use methotrexate. And then one of our UK doctors was like, yeah, we've been doing this for years. So I think yeah. it's, you know, it, we're becoming more aware of it um, and we're realising that actually sometimes you don't have to do anything right. because the pregnancy, the ectopic pregnancy may resolve by itself. Yeah. But as long as you've found it and you know what you're dealing with and you've got the resources around you to be able to monitor someone closely. Right. Yeah, I guess... I guess that's true, and I feel like we're finding that out about more um, about different conditions because I feel like it comes from a good place. I think, right? You know, as someone who is you know a doctor or practices medicine, you want to be able to help your patient. They're coming in, they're yeah. looking for care, and I think you know, particularly, you know, in the U.S., there's like a high output and generation of you know we need to do this and this mm-hmm. and this and this and you know, and I feel yeah. like here. Sometimes it's more, well, let's just take a breath, you yeah. know? Like, I don't know. Yeah, Maybe yeah, that's yeah. my analysis. But yeah, I think, yeah, yeah. you know, it can be, it's important to do that. It's mm-hmm. important to, to look at the patient and give them sort of what we're getting at is the mm-hmm. individualized care mm-hmm. yeah. towards. Exactly. And some treatment options will be better for some people. And it's really about having that discussion, um, reviewing all of your information that you have, um, and then having that one-to-one discussion with a patient to say you know these are treatment options of course as a healthcare professional you are allowed to advise um, them on what you think is the best thing for them but essentially I think you know as long as if the patient um, has the information they're also empowered in their own care and I think that's really important yeah um, so that they're not sort of fed through the system not really understanding what's going on absolutely um, it's good to it's good for them to understand the process and think what you said earlier about healthcare professionals just wanting to do something and it's very true and it does it does come from a good place you Mm -hmm. know we're supposed to help people so if something has been said that it can help people Mm -hmm. then why wouldn't you want to do that um but what i what we're trying to say is actually you know it used to be done like this ectopic pregnancies used to need surgery all the time Mm -hmm. Which is probably why there's this sort of um, huge fear around it because um, because women did you know and unfortunately women do still become unwell but in the past it was a lot more right but now we've had advances in surgery advances in imaging things like blood tests and protocols and research we can actually say okay well we don't necessarily need to do that anymore and then we can just keep doing that with the different management options and say okay, well, this does work, why don't we um, try and see whether it works more? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, if methotrexate really is that great, then why are the studies around it saying that it's not better than expectant management for for a certain subgroup of of, um, of women, ones with low hormone pregnancy levels, etc. But, yeah, it's just this, um, and I think this is what we always need to do with research, is to continue questioning why are we doing things in a certain way? Um, can we do something in a better way? Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, but I think that's you know one of the most important things is to constantly evolve, constantly challenge our old views as well. Yeah, absolutely. and to say yeah, to find new ways to, to do something. Yeah, yeah, and I think um, sort of just as you were saying, it's it's not. It's, and it's not even necessarily that as, you know, a clinician you're not then treating them because watchful waiting, I think, is mm, the term yeah. is, you're still, you're still involved and you're still doing something and, yeah. you know, even though it may not be a physical intervention, it's, you know, that's still sort of like, it provides care to the patient, so I think that's good to Yeah, yeah, on. absolutely, yeah. Um, okay, so in terms of the studies, like in your research, we've highlighted a lot kind of in this <clears throat> podcast about the importance of having evidence-based research Mm -hmm. and different types of analyses that can be done and you sort of talk about how um, in your research you found that the inclusion criteria can be different and then they will make concluding remarks based off of different inclusion criteria. 
in terms of ectopic pregnancies and the management of that, we've already touched on this um, a little bit, but what is your main kind of like output from this and in future directions for research looking at the management of ectopic pregnancies? Yeah, yeah, so um, yeah, my research, um, a lot of what, what I'm doing as we covered earlier is comparing the different management options for ectopic pregnancies, for tubal ectopic pregnancies. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the studies that I did very interested in this whole me expectant management versus methotrexate debate to answer the age-old question of, oh, you know, which one is better? Mm -hmm. is, does methotrexate actually work? Um, so it's a study called an individual participant data meta-analysis, very long term, for essentially um, what I've done is collected uh, raw data from various studies and pooled them to have a bigger data set and then to um, undertake um, further analyses from a bigger data set. So we looked at all the studies that compared expectant and methotrexate um, for ectopic pregnancies, tubules, and we only found four studies and we could only include two. One study was quite old and they used oral methotrexate, so like tablet form, which we now know isn't effective for anything, it's essentially placebo. Okay. And then another study, um, part of their inclusion criteria was the hormone pregnancy level had to be already falling before they could be included in the study. So yeah, that, that kind of means, well, that probably means that the pregnancies, exactly the pregnancies were already resolving, right? Yeah. So whether you use expectant methotrexate, you're not really gonna get that um, answer that you want. Um, and then, so we included two studies, um, one with a Dutch team and one in the UK, which was from Yerkowitz um, study mm -hmm. and uh, we had 152 cases and when we combined them and reanalyzed them we still found that um, neither was, was more effective than the other. There's no sort of uh, significant change in things like surgical intervention as well. Um, so that was one study and then I did a, a, another study with um, Dr. Almatar's team again with Prof. Yerkowitz um, that looked at all the treatment options, including surgery, but also other medical treatments that are used uh, possibly around the world, or maybe they were used historically but aren't now anymore. Mm -hmm. And when you compare all of them, surgery is the best because you know it's removing the pregnancy, so it's always going to be the most effective. But actually, when you look at conservative treatments, so again, looking at methotrexate and expectant, mm -hmm. mostly, there, there still wasn't a a difference and when you're really looking down at these studies a lot of them are comparing methotrexate to methotrexate so there's no placebo there's no control which would be expectant management mm -hmm. so I think the question is how can you certainly know that methotrexate is better than not doing anything mm -hmm. if you're not really comparing it to to your control the yeah and yeah. this is where all the older studies came from so um, I mean, I was doing a, a little bit of a dig around in terms of where did methotrexate come from, and yeah. I think it was um, started being used for ectopic pregnancies in the 80s um, because it was historically used for gestational trophoblastic disease, um, which is like an abnormal sort of um, growth of um, pregnancy cells. Right. So it doesn't result in a normal pregnancy. And then they said, well, why don't we try that on an ectopic pregnancy? So they did a few case series and they said, oh, it resolved. Right. And then in the 90s, um, someone did a cohort study. So they just, um, as in they, they only looked at women who were treated with um, methotrexate and they said, oh, look, it works. But actually, and, and that's where a lot of the methotrexate sort of um, regimes come from now, um, from that study in the 90s. And then based on that, more and more studies were, were made um, but essentially, apart from the four that I spoke about, um, comparing methotrexate and expectant, which is placebo control, mm -hmm. all the other studies were comparing it against a different type of methotrexate, or a different regimen of methotrexate, or mm -hmm. methotrexate and something else. Um, and then they've said, yes, it works. And you're like, but, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it could just be that it's resolving. Yeah. And instead of saying, actually, this definitely works, why aren't we challenging that and saying, okay, well, if, if you okay. do think Okay, I found works. this on the web, for, but it could just be that. Check it out. Sorry. <laughs> um, 
instead of challenging it. Yeah, so, uh, you know, why, if we really do think it works, uh, and maybe it does, maybe it does for a certain group of women, for a certain pregnancy level, hormone level, um, then why don't we do more studies, um, larger studies, looking at that and a control? Yeah. And then we can finally, hopefully, answer that question. But so far, everything that's been out there says that it's not, you know, statistically more, um, statistically significantly, be yeah, different, better, etc. Yeah. Interesting. So I guess this highlights sort of your research and your PhD, probably mm -hmm. the focus of it. But in this episode, really, just the importance of kind of taking a step back sometimes in the different treatment options that we have mm -hmm. and also the research. As you said, that's been done. It's important to keep questioning. And it's not to say that methotrexate isn't helpful because it potentially is. Yeah. But it maybe we don't have the data to back this up yeah. properly. So yeah. it's important, I think, it highlights the bigger point of yeah. making sure that we have this kind of evidence-based research because otherwise it's kind of like, yeah, we're not really sure. Yeah, and then 40 years later, you're still using that treatment, and you dig around, and you're like, why are we using this? Right. And then you find this information, you're like, oh, yeah. okay. And I, I think it's very easy to get led by um, something that's been around for such a long time. It's just the way that things were done, yeah. you know? So let's just continue it, because it's working for us. Interesting. Um, whereas, actually, I think the whole point of research is to kind of say, it's to, you know, go beyond um, search elsewhere and say, mm -hmm. actually, I, I, I think this, and I'll do some research mm -hmm. to prove it or disprove it. Um, it's just a challenge the way that we're doing things. Um, because essentially, at the end of it, is what is most beneficial for the patient. So, and that should be, that's at the heart of all of our research, is what is best for the patient. Mm -hmm. um, and that should really be the core of it all mm -hmm. um, and we need whenever we're doing any form of research we need to say you know how is this beneficial for for the patient how is it going to improve their, their quality of life how is it going to save them etc mm -hmm. i love it you really you've highlighted i think what i think a lot of researchers share in common is that sort of drive behind it really mm -hmm. well which i think is great um <clears throat> so going just sort of forwards in this field closing off this episode, thinking about kind of the future of the management of ectopic pregnancies and, you know, you practice in clinic, you're also doing your research on this. What do you hope to see going forwards? I mean, also, are there certain things that you really want to stress that in clinic sometimes you have patients where it's a common misconception? Like, what are certain just bits that you want to maybe address? To address, yeah. Um, I mean, in terms of improving where you know where we want to go in the future, um, I, th I always say more research. I think everyone says more research, um, but behind that, more funding mm -hmm. as well, um, particularly in women's health research. And I think it's um, women's health funding and women's health um, research has gained a lot of traction this year, and I mm -hmm. think we need to keep pushing that forward. Um, I'm always going to say more research into expectant versus uh, methotrexate mm -hmm. because that's that's you know, what my PhD is based on um, and uh, I think also sort of emphasizing in, in pregnancy I think there's a lot of emphasis and rightly so on the second and third trimester um, but less so on the first trimester which is usually when things like ectopic pregnancies get picked up so um, and it's associated with uh, you know significant pregnancy loss um, and it's something that a lot of people just don't talk about because they think it's a taboo subject or you know it's not as important because it's just first trimester um, but it's hu hugely important for so many people it impacts people in so many different ways so I think a lot more research on the early pregnancy a lot more emphasis on that as well because that's really where you can provide quite a lot of support um, you can you know, optimize someone's pregnancy from the very early stages. I mean, that should be like pre-pregnancy, but you know, first trimester as well is really important. Um, so I think a bit more focus on that. Another thing that I keep advocating for is better quality ultrasounds. Um, working in an amazing scan unit at UCL Hospital, I've seen how transformative a good quality ultrasound is. Not just in early pregnancy, but gynecology. Um, and I think the reason why a lot of the studies um, in the 
past haven't, you know, they're not as good quality as uh, there's there's this lacking in a good quality ultrasound. Um, so what is the what is the patient um, population that you're studying? Mm -hmm. Is it truly an ectopic pregnancy, or is it something called pregnancy of unknown location, mm -hmm. which is when you have a positive pregnancy test but you can't see on the scan mm -hmm. at UCA at UCL um, Hospital because mm -hmm. the scanning is of you know, high quality. We know that P wells, most of them are resolving pregnancies, so like miscarriages mm -hmm. that are too early to pick up an ultrasound. Whereas in other parts of the UK and around the world, um, these you know these get confused with things like ectopic pregnancies as well, and, and, and all too common they're lumped into the same um, groups, but they're two two very different um, disease entities that you're, that you're looking at. So how can you do a study? kind of crosses all of that together and then say yeah this is good for ectopic pregnancies and what we found in this meta-analysis of 31 studies that we did is that half of them didn't even have a diagnostic criteria for ectopic pregnancy half of them said yes we saw an ultrasound scan and then the other I think there were a quarter that were non-specific and then another quarter that didn't say anything so mm. like well what, what were you you know who who were you including what what was happening within these true ectopic pregnancies are actually just resolving pregnancies, right? Um, and that comes down to better imaging, yeah. and that's just early pregnancy. And there's so many benefits in gynecology um, with a good quality ultrasound scan. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's another thing. And I suppose the last thing that I want to emphasise and highlight is that um, management plans have to be very um, patient centred and tailored to the patient, to um, her medical history, um, their presentation, how they are, who, you know, what's their family unit, um, what their expectations, or their, you know, it, it's based on so many different things and mm -hmm. one thing may not necessarily fit another, so it's really important to have um, that sort of way of, of treating anything actually yeah. for it's not just ectopic pregnancies but for everything um, in women's health is to make sure that the patient is at the center um, and yeah advise them agree yeah and I think that's a common concept that we've had <clears throat> like I said here on the podcast is sort of that individual shifting more towards as, as best as we can with the resources we have available to us mm -hmm. is the individualized sort mm -hmm. of patient care yeah. and management. Yeah, yeah, so important, yeah. Mm. Well, this has been so interesting and um, I have absolutely loved speaking with you about this. So thank you so much for joining me today. Well, thanks for having me.